So are humans part of nature? What do you think? Humans are also come up in the evolutionary process. So, so if you look at the evolution, every species, every form of nature is playing a, some specific role. Right? So, do humans have any role in nature? Or are they just to do their own thing, independent of everything else? How do you as an individual relate to nature? That also could be part of the sharing. For a long time I've been very, uh, I really enjoy spending time in nature. Uh, I spend quite a lot of time alone in nature. And one of the reasons that I love being here so much, we live in this village also, um, is because it feels really quite wild and real. Just above the village you go into the forest and it's, it's a pretty, it's very unlike um, human controlled environment. And one thing I always find myself is extremely peaceful there, actually. And I, I notice that like nature just feels very unconfused. I feel there's no, I mean, I, of course, I, I don't want to, um, whatever the word is, um, I don't want to Disneyfy it. I don't want to, you know, be too romantic about it. But, um, but it just feels so. It feels very timeless, and it feels very, yeah, just unconfused, actually. And uh, I find that incredibly attractive. So I spend a lot of time just being up in, up in the hills here, just uh, spending time, just sitting with the beauty of the unconfused nature, actually. And I feel really strongly. Sometimes it's really. It's kind of mesmerizingly beautiful, actually. But, um, and I just feel, it's, yeah, I, I just love the fact that it's, it feels very ancient, actually. I think that's the, the thing I really, really feel. It feels like it's been like that for so long, you know, longer than I can imagine, actually. I mean, I can kind of imagine it, but actually, that's just an image in my head. But the reality is it's been there, like, for millions of years, actually, just unconfused. Yeah, I find that very powerful. Continuous. Yeah, I mean, I also love being in nature, but and and you know we are part of nature. So, and actually, when you look around, everything seems to have an order, like it's very orderly, and uh, you know, I think, like for me, the, the scariest thing is like it seems like we humans have. We don't recognize what our our orderly relationship to that nature is anymore. And actually, most of what we do, we get from nature, we, we, we transform it into something that can't go back in the cyclical way that everything else goes back. And so we're actually kind of, in some ways, depleting, like horribly depleting nature, taking out from some from it things which we can't put back in in an organic way. And uh, you know, what you know, how can we see that, and how can we actually correct that so we don't feel this is an endless thing that we can do because obviously we've already created so much damage and I think that you know like of course I love being in nature and stuff but I feel like that that order that responsibility that we have in this whole scheme of things is you know super important to recognize and and, and participate in that in a responsible way also a few years ago I come across an information um, it is called infridim rhythm, just like we have a circadian rhythm. Close it's a 24-hour cycle, circadian rhythm. Uh, we women, once we start having our periods, uh, our infridim rhythm kicks in. And the infridim rhythm goes on for 28 days, which is our menstrual cycle. And that menstrual cycle is divided into four different parts. Um, follicular, ovulatory, luteal, and menstrual. And these phases are in correlation with the seasons that we see in the nature. 
like the menstrual phase is our body's winter season follicular phase is our body's spring season ovulatory phase is our body's summer season and luteal phase is autumn or fall so learning about this information made me feel more connected to the nature and the moon itself because moon even uh, has a 28 days ka cycle so it is very powerful the entire information i, I cannot go on talking about it right here but um, it has changed my relationship with nature the way i um, witness nature or the way i interact with nature um, i have found myself respecting nature even more once i um, learned how we are deeply connected to nature how it is all interdependent we are not independent um, it is a give and take between us and the nature in fact we and the nature are one and the same now again this will be a lot more philosophical but yes you asked now like what is our relationship with nature i feel that we i and nature are the same like we all and nature are the same we are not different from one another anybody here nature but the same way human is the only entity who understand the nature and uh, functioning of nature and human uh, take decision decision accordingly and uh, contribute as other things of nature human after understanding uh, human can also contribute in harmonious way so the human is only entity who understand the nature and the same way is the part of the nature also these days we talk a lot about global warming climate change and other such phenomena pollution this is all connected with that i would just talk about a small part of uh, the nature which is the air i uh, didn't quite realize just how pervasive and affected place even though it is literally around us all the time uh, but uh, uh, just like living in delhi uh, you realize that the number of years of life you are l- losing because of the air that is around you and uh, just like constantly having a mask uh because of that and uh, uh like i live in a joint family so we have a lot of kids and uh, like kids uh w- the youngest one uh was born in 2010 when uh, the air started getting uh, really poor and uh, he's right now 12 and he's gotten bronchitis uh because like uh, the fact that he's he was born at a time when uh, the air in delhi was just really bad and he used to play a lot uh, so just uh now that it has started playing such a negative role am i realizing that uh, how and this coming as the first thing that i was looking forward to was the change in air hopefully uh and uh, like i was slightly disappointed that oh there will be forest fires here it, it's not to be found here as well the the best air so just like the desire to uh see the like i don't think we can have a full life until we have a full and like he said a harmonious understanding and relationship with nature as our body is made of the five elements the sky sun soil water and air these all the five elements are the part of the nature so this is how we are connected with the nature without nature like there is nothing like we we cannot exist and as a human entity like if we the purpose of life if, if i can think like i'm not sure like we uh, we are evolved as a thinking as a conscious uh, entity like the purpose can be like 
to make a nature a better place for the other uh, animals, other living beings. Uh, like that could be the purpose, like for humans, which I don't know, like is fulfilling or not. And this point will be covered later on. Human beings uh, have been claiming that they are a part of nature, but uh, how far they could fully comprehend? question which I think we have to elaborate upon. How this understanding has developed if we see in primitive societies. Uh, human uh, race was more uh, impacted by the uh, negative side of nature. Uh, nature provided food, shelter, everything, caves. But at the same time uh, th they were uh, uh, negative things like harsh temperatures, uh, weather conditions, and uh, uh, calamities. So uh, psychologically, uh, the bad things impact you more. So uh, humans, they uh, treated a need to control nature. Like uh, we try to control temperature, we, we, we want to go inside some shade or we want to uh, have a AC. So that's a way we have been trying to control the nature. And uh, if you see recently say uh, 40s, 50s, if you see Hindi films, in most of the Hindi films you will find a contractor who is a forest contractor. His main job is to cut trees. Uh, and that was supposed to be a very good thing to do. It was so uh, prevalent all around that uh, these types of contracts were awarded to clear uh, forest uh, for agriculture or maybe some other use. So till even I can say uh, 50, 60 years back, the understanding was so poor. Unless this uh, nature uh, started showing manifest the results of what you are doing. So uh, I am not, not sure how far still we have been uh, able to understand. To just add to what you said, and we've lived in Dehradun for some time and there is a forest research institute, there, FRI, which was established more than a hundred years back there. And we went for a visit there and in the main area, very large display they have written. This institute was established for exploiting the forest resource. We've been doing that. That's the main objective. Yes, please. Anybody else? Not a sharing per se, but just uh, now uh, we use a word called capitalize on it. Oh, uh, are they like that? Oh, how can we capitalize on it? So I live in a city and uh, I spent my childhood amidst greenery. Uh, so in those days, you know, the trees were painted red and white. So those trees were... Uh, came in the directory of trees maintained by the government and those were not supposed to be cut. And we grew up thinking that these trees are never going to be cut, you have to take care of them and so on. But now road widening and I see <laughs> so many trees just gone. They're just not there because we need bigger roads and we need bigger things. Right now as I live in the city I feel I feel separated from nature. I don't feel part of it because I'm only amidst man-made things. I don't, uh, and even the gardens are landscaped and curated. They don't feel real. The bushes are perfectly cut. Uh, the flower beds are perfect. You know, it doesn't feel real. It feels all very artificial. It doesn't feel part of nature at all. So we, 
uh, our society is next to a tekdi. Tekdi is a small hill. And uh, there is a group of people who have been working really hard to plant trees and reforest that uh, hill. But you know, it's been such a huge task because the more the buildings come in, the more the groundwater gets depleted and more trees die. So you plant them. We usually, every Sunday, we form a chain, human chain to water these plants so that they don't die. But it, it's so, it, it just makes me feel that, you know, the so-called development that we say, is that really development? Cities are being developed, people are rushing into cities. Is that really development? Because it's actually depleting all the resources and the beauty of, of the space as it was earlier. So, though I would, and I feel helpless because I don't know how to bring about the change. I can bring about a little change from my side by being good to animals, maybe raising a fight in the society that don't kill the snakes that are around. Snakes are harmless most often. They, most of the snakes around are not poisonous. Please take care of the dogs that are there or the cats that are there. Where, uh, don't harm them. But beyond that, you know, I feel really helpless because if you see something, tomorrow somebody has taken over the land and they have started construction. So I don't know how one individual could change or a group of individuals change things. It is something that the, that the entire human world needs to, you know, literally I think some bulldozing needs to be done in a way to make them realize what they're doing, the harm that they're doing. And I guess, no, I don't know how many Greta Thunbergs or how many other activists we're going to need to do that. And, and to give up your life and everything for a cause. That's also another thing. Yeah. Bulldozing is a popular thing right now. <laughs> Maybe it's not a solution. It would be the cause of the problem. Yeah. just mentioned about the menstrual cycle and she talked about harming nature so it kind of struck me that our relationship with nature reflects our relationship with our own body and vice versa like because nature is cyclical and just like the summer then winter like all the seasons go round and round and there is time for rest there is time for productivity there is time for everything but we are continuously, as we see it, we are in rat race. So we are constantly uh, trying our best to be productive, to be efficient, to do more, to be more. We are not making enough time to just be. And like even uh, when we mention about slowing down, some people feel uncomfortable with the idea of slowing down. So uh, we need to inquire why this resistance is coming from. Like what, what is the reason? And it kind of reflects in the way we see the nature as well. We are constantly exploiting nature. We are not giving it a sustainable time to flourish, to just let it be. So that's one thing that came to my mind, that our relationship with nature equals to our relationship with our own body. And you also mentioned about uh, the five elements of nature. Again, it is about body as well. So yes. Uh, so one aspect that I'm hearing is kind of an order, right? From my standpoint, there is no designed order per se. We we seem to look for an order. So if you look at something like fractals in maths, there is no order. But when something gets built, we see order into it. So basically, any any individual species or any individual of any species per se, I don't think they have any moral boundary to look at this is my role that I have to play be it a plant, be it any animal. Right? For example, if you look at Delhi, see the acacia was planted and the acacia took over all of it. The whole of ridge is acacia. They are taking out, they are trying to make it more deciduous forest. Same way the Burma python went to US. 
and it is taken as an invasive species because it does not allow the native species to live. So it is not, they come with any moral boundary. The difference that I see with the human animal per se and the other animal is that most of the animal are bounded by their biological bedrock. They have very limited flexibility over that in terms of their cognitive stuff. The humans have more flexibility out there, which means their ability to change something compared to the other ones is more larger. And that's, that's the main difference. But the order is not something it is there because of the evolution happening together. And we seem to have a lens to look at order. That's, that's how I look at it. Gurgaon is one of the upcoming or probably already there IT city. All the societies that are made are made on the farmland which is being sold by the farmers or whoever. Um, we have, I mean my own society is made on that farmland only. And this farmer has even more land, which he's either given giving to uh, rag pickers, and they're making jupris out there, or he's. I mean, when I when I was shift when I shifted in that uh, society, there was this huge. How say you? Sarso ke khet. Mustard fields. Mustard fields, and then eventually, in those three years, I've seen them go, and the land is being taken. He's giving on rent for these people. So I don't know. I mean, we are all responsible for it. Uh, capitalizing again on the fact that probably he's feeling whatever his mindset is that he may get an immediate money, which is and all these farmers in all in uh, Gurgaon have a great BMWs or Audis in which they travel. Their son, they don't have to work for the next probably four, five year, four, five generations. I don't know. That's one thing that I was thinking of. The other is that our organization, our office is based in uh, sector forty, and this is a huge, there's a huge greenery out there, which thankfully, and it is a co-working space between some one dispensary which is being taken care by the government and us. And there's a huge green lemon trees there, some jamun kipade, there is, uh, we have also developed a kitchen garden there. And whenever our, I mean, we call them members, the people who live with mental illness, they come there, um, they always say that, you know, this place is so peaceful. Amongst the mess and the madness that Gurgaon is, that particular place gives us a little surreal feeling and kind of gives us a contact with nature so the green becomes greener when there is rain there and we try and save it as much as possible although i don't know for how long we would be able to do that but that's our that's our contact with the nature the other thing i was thinking was this save the soil campaign which is going on mm -hmm. and i mean i'm just i i am very ignorant about all of this but i the only thing by the name of it i'm understanding that the whole agenda is to raise awareness about saving the soil. I mean, we ha we are at this point where we have to save something which is so much in abundance, which was supposed to be so much in abundance, and yet we, we are at a point where we are trying to save it now. So, I don't know what is there for us in the future. Uh, the topics you were talking about brought some nice uh, examples to mind about the role of human in nature. And how I see it is that since humans are these creative beings with agency, we have, uh, and since we have agency, we it's very evident all the bad that we can do. But when we think of role, I, I'm imagining the good that we can do, the value we can add to it. And the examples that come to mind are say, you know how we've managed to breed var variants of plants and trees and animals that are stronger over time by identifying certain qualities and things that happen in nature naturally over a long period of time, if we're able to recognize uh, the natural cycles that they're a part of and are able to maintain that, then we're able to improve the quality of that and do it more uh, efficiently <laughs> uh, and uh, put them to good use. But at the same time, if you think about breeding again 
and trying to do this without identifying the natural cycles of nature, we can also do it in a very problematic manner, which causes all sorts of side effects that were not considered because we were too, you know, what's it called? Blind, the thing that horses have. Blinkers, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, humans can add to nature. Another example was the soil and how natural cycles already lead to the to s soils becoming healthier over time. But humans can also do that um, and they can do it, uh, when they put their mind to it, they can do it very systematically. I mean, they can build upon existing natural systems and make them even more robust and we can create compost and do it much faster than it was probably already happening and hence add to the natural cycles that you know were already in place. So I think that's one important role. We're talking about role of humans in nature. So when you mentioned what we can do, I just thought of what uh, our organization is doing. I mean, we do have a compost like this in our organization because we do a lot of cooking there. So uh, the, all those vegetable peels and all are being there. I mean, they are being dumped there so that natural fertilizer can be made. The other thing we are doing uh, as part of saving the planet in a way is recycle paper, using recycled papers. Although sometimes it gets to our, I mean, it's a, it's a guideline that uh, the management has taken. It sometimes it very, it's very frustrating because we have to use even the smallest of piece of paper and we kind of make fun of it, but come to think of it, uh, in a larger perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And I think these are small steps that organizations, at an organizational level, people uh, can take to um, make this a better, um, place the again uh, use of water how we are being told when we are washing our utensils in our organization we are being told that please turn off the tap when you're not using it or you know acs would not be on it's not just about electricity and the bill that we will be, at, be, be getting because we are an ngo and it's funding that we um, kind of get but it's also um, the fact that do we need it in the morning like 9 to 11 is a good time for us where it's quite it's quite okay. It does not need. We do not need a uh, AC at that point in time. So nine to eleven, don't switch on the AC. After in the peak hours, please switch it on. So I think uh, maybe if at not an at an indi individual level, but maybe at an organizational level, if people can think of it, uh, it could be a better place. I guess. Humans plant humans on this planet. How did they come about? <laughs> so we are the error of nature. <laughs> it is probably error. Who is reviewing the, this code now? Are we the code reviewers? Oh, nature has made an error. I think germinated the a... human beings. Now we <laughs> must wipe them out. Yeah, I think. It... Not to think about that. Okay. I think that there is a tendency to think of, say, nature as mountains and waterfalls and, you know, um, tigers. But I mean, and that the city is just a completely cancerous and um, unnatural thing um, for us to partake in. I feel as if whatever falls within our organic bounds. Say something like a library. I don't think that there's anything, what is unnatural about a library? Adding a compost pit to a library doesn't make it, say, more natural or um, less natural. Um, and I think there is often a confusion between what is natural and what is wild. I don't, and I think that that is a useful distinction to make because then we can think of human beings as natural entities and um, it's only then that we can begin to see that some of the things that we are doing wrong are unnatural. It is unnatural to do those things in that it is almost, um, to use um, Jim's word, insane. If somebody, if a Martian, say, were to look at what we are doing, they would conclude that they've gone mad, that they are uh, basically going completely outside of their own capabilities and nature, and that they're destroying their own nature. Um, so I don't think that nature necessarily has to mean, say, a wild object or um, 
what is natural basically means what has the right organization to exist um, and human beings also have that organization so i don't think that say something like a city definitely needs to be um unsustainable i think that it is imaginable we can imagine a sustainable city if we can't then i think that we are looking at a very bleak um future if we have no um cities uh as uh, we can understand them in an ideal sense saying there could be natural cities yeah i think that there have to be anybody here okay then uh, one last topic i can't resist sorry i thought this was the last but one thing more comes to mind all this that we have talked the human domain and now in association with the nature another very dominant aspect of human living which is uh, known by the name of spirituality or religion whichever you are comfortable with what do you see how do you see what's its role how you relate to it does it have any importance in human living uh so somebody uh, define uh, once i was in a workshop and somebody defined uh, religion as uh, uh, rules or social norms according to place profession and time so that too was the first i i never been a very religious person my whole life but that was the time when i felt that you know if religion is something like that i am ready to follow it so that was the only time a definition felt like correct second thing is uh, spirituality spirituality I, i would say is the connection my connection as an individual with the universe and uh, that is essential for uh, each one of us because uh, if we are not spiritual if we do not have understand that realm of our life uh, we'll end up living a very uh, small life so that is why uh, spirituality is essential so that we can go beyond what is given to us in a physical form i think i uh, kind of agree with that uh, definition of religion in the sense that uh, like uh, it's very expansive uh, that religion is a system of beliefs and therefore you can explain a lot of things like a lot of people are following religion every day even though they might not be following religion religion per se they might not be visiting god's house uh, but let's say for example if someone uh, is driven by the idea of capitalism they're working 24 hours in a day or whatever they are essentially following a religion right because they are following a system of beliefs they have put something or someone in their life on a pedestal and i think that kind of satisfies the loose definition of religion uh, even i don't know nationalism can be a religion that way like, like a lot of isms could sort of fall in religion that way okay that we are all each and every one of us is a perfect being but we still have to evolve to something better than we are at this moment religion i've been brought up in a particular way so theek hai but i have now realized that very structured very deep very uh, what's the word i'm trying to get at very uh uh rigid uh thou shalt do and thou shalt not and you don't do this and you don't do that and you begin to wonder whether this power that that is within you and all around us uh that has created us and the nature around us what kind of a power is it is it is it a hateful power is it a loving power i have been in my religion i've been taught that it's a very loving power we give it a name you all give you all each of you give your your idea and your name to your religion whatever it is but at the respect of each person is there to my respect to all your beliefs and everything is there but uh, when it's very structured it becomes complicated then it becomes complicated my way the way i feel 
okay, yes, I do go to uh, to a church where where things are uh, certain the certain amount of structure in it. But I noticed lately that it's been sort of opening up a little bit, and we're really having an awful lot of fun. And I believe that this power that is within us and around us is really a loving, caring, and wanting to impart that power or the answers to our questions. That power seems to be there and wants to guide us and help us as and when we uh, ask. There's no in I, I find there's no interference with that power. There's no interference. Your choices are all yours. Take the consequences or you can even ask for answers, guidance. And I, in my own heart, I do strongly believe I will get it. I will get all the things that I want. Oh, not want, need. Wanting is wanting, just wanting. And the power will tell you, okay, I'll give you the experience of wanting, which doesn't get you anywhere. But it's your desire, your, um, your desire for something. I wish I could have something. I wish, now this is what I need. I wish I could have it. It will come to you. It doesn't have to come to you this very second because human beings are always in a jaldabaji of their own. Whatever we want, we want it now. We're not, we're not happy. We don't want to wait. Is that not right? We all want whatever we want, we want it now. Sometimes the power tells you, hang on, hang on. I have a better route for you. I have a better way. I have something better for you. And these are my feelings. Now, each one of you has your own take. So be it. And I love you all and I respect it all. Yes. Does this aspect affect you? Does it have any impact on you? I would like to share my thoughts about the spirituality. Uh, I, it, like everyone, uh, this question arises in everyone's mind. Like, what happens when a person dies? Like, right. the body remains the same. And what is that thing like that goes out of the body? We can say it the soul, soul or the uh, energy or the jivan tattu. Like. These are the like surnames that we can use. And if we think about the, with that uh, perspective, we we can feel like a, we there is some energy inside us which is a part of the higher energy, higher energy or we can say the higher consciousness. The This is a uh, spirituality is a part of like when we feel like we are the part of the higher energy uh, and we have the same energy that we can use for like forgetting once we understand this we are a part of the higher energy we can achieve anything like we can uh, use this energy to fulfill our like goal that is a spirituality Anybody else? How do you relate to spirituality or religion? Yes. Ask the mic. Okay. To put it simply, religion dictates and tells us that what the higher power is or the God is. And spirituality lets you experiment and experience that power yourself so that you can come up with your own understanding and definition about the way you relate to that certain power. It's a difference between both. So I'm not sure if this uh, falls in both the categories of religion or spirituality. But I think it's somewhat still related is uh, like a lot of people uh, um, and also myself, we have this need for tran feeling transcendence or something. 
like so for example when you listen to sufi music or when you look at the stars or when you watch some science fiction movie or something i don't know people get this feeling of transcendence where you have just i don't know connected to something deeper which is just way above your own self i don't know your self kind of melts away when you do that uh i'm not sure of how it falls in our discussion but i think it's some somewhat related i'm not sure to the first question uh, whether religion affects us certainly there is no doubt about that and it affects in a big way the second question what religion is the most difficult and i think we have been trying to define it but i think we have not succeeded a few uh, characteristics of religion what i can see is one first is that a religion is not what it appears i mean this is the most important characteristic of uh, religion that uh, disguising uh, art of disguising uh, has been acquired by the religion over the centuries and so the uh, this way this has survived so long if you see some knowledge a few thousand years back and uh, you see that is the eternal knowledge and the human race mind or thought has not developed up to that this appears very ridiculous if you think outside of religion but uh, religion makes you believe it my own understanding is that uh, and secondly uh, in spite of that in spite of a uh, very uh, kind of aesthetic thought uh, which has not evolved religion as an institution has evolved over time uh, to uh, affect all the generations my personal understanding of religion is that uh, it's a power institution like any other institution like a state uh, you control people this religion is basically to control people F- we may see as rules and regulations but who will make the rules and regulations who will implement that who will punish for not following rules and regulations there will be somebody so that somebody actually controls so religion ultimately becomes a power uh, institution to control is spirituality uh, to be very frank i don't understand i think we can discuss what is spirituality uh, uh, having some interest in philosophy i can say that uh, philosophically you can say it's opposite of materialism then what is materialism materialism is basically uh in uh, we we have concept of uh, matter and consciousness materialism believes that consciousness is also a product of uh, uh, matter it's not something uh, it comes from somewhere like soul or consciousness eh? maybe spirituality is when we believe that consciousness is different from matter eh? and we see it in a different perspective altogether uh, uh, then uh, everything after birth uh, before birth after birth and what happens after uh, death so all those things come because we uh, believe in survival uh, of a human being after uh, something remains after uh, a human uh, person dies something remains and that is not part of the Uh, prakriti that is not part of uh, matter matter so that is but uh, i mean th- th- this is just a, i mean uh, i cannot say i mean this accept, can be acceptable this is this can be my own version but spirituality again has been defined in so many ways and uh, it is almost you can say is a subjective uh, issue
I think uh, b- both uh, religion and spirituality has this angle of looking for some sort of good uh, goodness. Some so like there's some search for virtue, and um, um, but religion as institutions, it seems that that virtue is sort of externally imposed. This is what is virtuous. Do this. You have to, and you suppose there is some element of following. Um, I'm not very sure about spirituality, but it it appears to me that it it's a in in a sort of um, common trend context. I would say it's a it's a reaction to that sort of um, external imposition of religion. That no, my spirituality is connected to my questions, my search for virtue, my. Um, uh, and it's not, and and I don't want it to be controlled by any sort of institution or person or anything like that. But uh, I'm not. I, I don't. Although I do see a search for virtue in myself, I sort of do not feel a connection. I've never felt a sort of connection to either um, ideas. And maybe because I don't understand the religion one. So for sure, I don't feel much connection to spirituality. Also, I've never felt a desire to kind of uh, look into much but maybe people have better you know definitions for me so that it might seem like something important sir is mudde pe ek bar mere pitaji se meri bahas hui wo bole ki tu bahut nastik ho gaya hai pooja paat aur baaki sari cheeze maine bahut kam kar di thi halaki bachpan se meri parvarish us sab mahol mein hui तो फिर मैं जैसे जैसे चीज़ों को जानने लगा तो ये सब कम हो गया रिटर्न में मैंने उनसे पूछा कि पिताजी आप एक बात बताओ कि आप तीन दिन से ज़्यादा पानी को छोड़ सकते हो पानी पीना छोड़ सकते हो बोला नहीं छोड़ सकते पाँच दस दिन से ज़्यादा खाना छोड़ सकते हो या सांस लेना छोड़ सकते हो बोले पॉसिबल नहीं है बोले कहा जो ये सब नेचुरली है जब मैं छोड़ ही नहीं सकता मैं तो नेचर का पार्ट ही हूँ आप किसे नास्तिक बोल रहे हैं कि जो मैं जो रूल्स और रेगुलेशन फॉलो नहीं कर रहा हूं जो बनाए गए हैं अगर मैं उन रूल और रेगुलेशंस को बिना जाने और मानते हुए फॉलो कर रहा हूं तो उससे मिल भी क्या रहा है तो सभी ये मेरी जिज्ञासा थी पर्सनली कि मैं सभी धर्मों को क्योंकि भक्ति वाला पार्ट जो ईश्वर वाला पार्ट है वो हमारे इंडिया का एक बहुत पुराना वे है और काफ़ी सफलता भी हमने पाई है इसमें तो जब मैंने जाँचना स्टार्ट किया तो यही था कि अपने अपने विचारों को जानना यानी खुद को जानना तो साधना के बारे में मेरा पर्सनल ओपिनियन यही है कि अपने भाव और विचारों पे यानी अपने विचारों पे लगातार फोकस बनाए रखना यही साधना है ये मेरा पर्सनल ओपिनियन है तो ये तो कंटिन्यू हो ही सकती है क्योंकि ये मशीन जो चौबीस से चौबीस घंटा चलने की क्षमता रखती है यानी कि शरीर अगर थक जाता है वो आठ घंटे काम भी कर लेता है श्रम कर लेता है तो मुझे एक नींद की आवश्यकता है लेकिन ये मशीन तो 24 घंटे चलने वाली है ये सपने भी सपने भी आते हैं तो उसमें भी मैं भय और चिंता से ग्रसित रहता हूँ तो जब 24 घंटे चलने वाली इतनी पावरफुल मशीन मेरे पास है तो मेरा मतलब मेरा तो ध्यान और साधना 24 घंटे चल ही सकती है राउंड में कुछ भी करूँ बॉडी से तो इस पर धीरे से फोकस गया तो जब मैंने इसे अंदर से जाना तो एक अलग ही एहसास और कुछ पाया वो अब अपना पर्सनल जर्नी है तो धार्मिकता के बारे में तो यही अंडरस्टैंडिंग है ओके वी सेइंग वाज ही हैड अ एज ही वाज ग्रोइंग अप वन डे हिज फादर सेड दैट यू बिकम वेरी रिलीजियस यू आर नॉट डूइंग द नॉर्मल प्रैक्टिसेस व्हिच दे डिड इन द हाउस होल्ड सो देन ही हैड अ discussion with him and saying like oh, can you stay without water for 3 days or for the food for 10 days uh, so if you can't then you you are a part of this nature because this comes from nature all this so the journey of exploring what is uh, religion or what is spirituality uh, is an individual journey and uh, What did he say in the end? आपने आखिर में क्या बोल रहे थे सॉरी आखिर में जिज्ञासा के बारे में बोला था कि जब जाना और अपने सो दिस इज बेसिकली अ बिलीफ सिस्टम विच इज इम्पोज बाई अदर्स एंड यू नीड टू नो इट 
if you're not uh, doing it without, uh, if you're doing it without understanding it, it won't deliver anything to you. So you really need to know it properly, and for that you need to have curiosity, and then only can you know it. So that is the main job. Yeah. Um, sir, एक चीज और ऐड करना चाहूँगा. हाँ. Um, मैंने जब पढ़ा कि भय से मुक्ति ही भक्ति है. तो पिताजी को भी देखा, अंकल जी को भी देखा. Uh, लगातार कुछ ऐसे हिंदू रिलिजन्स में बहुत सारी चालीसाएँ हैं भक्ति हैं तो कंटिन्यूस वो रेगुलर पढ़ते भी थे और बहुत ही एक फोकस के साथ उसे कंटिन्यू हर दिन एक फॉलो करना उनका रूल ही था और आज भी है वो कहीं भी रहे कैसे भी उसे और हमें भी बहुत टाइम तक फॉलो करना ही था करना पड़ा मानकर तो जब मैं देखा तो वो पूरा पढ़ते थे लेकिन मैं उस उनसे एक लाइन का मीनिंग बोल मतलब प्रॉपरली पूछता था तो घुमा फिरा के जवाब देते थे लेकिन प्रॉपरली उसका जवाब एंड टू एंड नहीं दे पाते थे तो इतने साल लगातार बोलने के बावजूद भी अगर हम अपने इमोशंस को कंट्रोल करने में असफल हैं तो उस चीज का मतलब क्या हुआ तो इससे इससे अच्छा ही है कि किसी चीज को जानकर उस चीज को उसके रिजल्ट को देखकर उसे फल को देखकर उसे किया जाए but whenever he used to ask questions to them they would not give a straight answer and uh, so he wonders that if you can't answer questions even after so much discipline and so much time being devoted then what's the point of this exercise so basically for me uh, the religion per se one is the definition itself is difficult to put same goes with spirituality right the point is i i would say it's more like an external stuff they trying to define my thing is i would put maybe another word called swadharm which is dharm also one of the definition is uphold what you feel is right and the swadharm is what you feel is right even dharm by itself means that only and upholding right is something that you have clear understanding of it not only cognitively experientially so it's like a way where you connect yourself to yourself in this so basically you are upholding what you connect with so the transcendence is that word which you're saying that takes you beyond these two things that i use the rag and the duesh right so you're not doing it because this is what makes you feel great or you're not doing it because you feel guilty if you don't do it it goes beyond that there's something you live with Pass the mic to Siddharth. So there is an obscurantist version of spirituality, which I don't subscribe to at all. Which is you know goat bones and uh, mendicants, <laughs> you know, and mysticism, which is mostly propounded you know by uh, uh, a sadguru or yeah, I would say even a Rabindranath Tagore, which I don't really subscribe to. Um, but there is a similar writing of of religion. um which i think is an error um i th- to take religion literally is wrong but then the people who write it off also just think that it is supposed to be taken literally so they write it off um so in that sense the error made by somebody who who says that i don't believe in religion because all of this is false is the same error that somebody who just fanatically believes it because they take it literally but um to take it seriously i think you can then that is a very fine distinction but then you can get a lot um um a lot of philosophical yield i think out of religion and from what i have read um i feel as if that there is a religiousness which is inherent to all human beings that is part of human nature where we have um an organic sensibility in that we can see things via the senses but somehow we have a feeling for something which is more than an organic sensibility and we i think we brought this up a fair number of times already a sort of capacity for abstraction um and the rest um and i think that we have in human culture um 
this ability to project ideal versions of ourselves um, right that we might say that we have certain values but to say that I have a value is to say that I have a desire for um, something and then I might say try and lead my life by those values and the objective there is that one day I will sort of idealize myself into um, what my values really are now that is at the I think that is the sort of kernel of religion but what religious institutions do is somewhat um, to patronize an individual in that you just say render it to the senses in that sense it is a uh, great degradation of what um, what we might call spirituality or I think is better called human culture because it allows an individual to cultivate themselves um, to flourish um, having said that uh, there is this fresco by Raphael this paint type of painting a very famous one called school of Athens um, where you have the two sort of uh, famous Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle one who is an idealist Plato and he is pointing to the sky but Aristotle is a more in my opinion wiser in that he in that painting he's sort of doing this um, that you know that we are limited to this world and our sort of understanding of ideal things is through what we can so that the world is sort of like a veil for um, something else but I don't think that we can cross that river um, it's not um, like I was saying earlier, we are limited in a certain sense and there are certain things that we just can't, um, certain questions we can't answer, I think, and certain questions that we maybe can't even ask. Um, but um, since we used to um, share uh, personal experiences, um, uh, there's something that I wanted to share, I think, which is relevant even to the last question about uh, humans and their relationship with nature. A couple of years back, I did a mountaineering course um, where uh, it was a month long course in Manali. And it culminated in this uh, you have to climb a mountain basically in one day. And it was not some very big mountain, um, but it was fairly physically challenging. And there were some 70, 80 of us. And uh, we spent the whole day just trying to lug ourselves to the top of this thing. Um, and there was a lot of mist and there was the seemingly unending ridge that we were just climbing, 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 climbing. And then there was a lot of mist which cleared. And then we saw that there was actually a much bigger mountain that we just hadn't seen. And I think that that was a moment which I feel like that is the closest that I have come to a spiritual sort of a moment because it was very overwhelming to realize that there were some 70, 80 of us just scrambling um, you know, to climb this thing that we thought was very big, but actually right next to us, we didn't see it. This whole time it was there, thousands of feet taller, but we just didn't um, see it. And to think that that is not even, these are not even say the top two, top three biggest mountains in the world. So there's some things that we just don't see. Um, and I think that we're not really able to answer those questions properly. Um, so I think religion maybe. Uh, gives us a feeling for some ideal things, but it is not perfect. Uh, I would just uh, like to take uh, one of the parts uh, that Siddharth mentioned, uh, the, uh, s the seeking of uh, our perfect selves. And uh, I, I, f I think that is what uh, religion would mean to me, uh, that uh, it's it's a effort to become a more uh, ideal version of ourselves. And... Uh, in that way, what Vibhu mentioned that uh, uh, a lot of people spend a lot of their time at work. I, I am also one of those. So because I feel like uh, that takes me to uh, a version of myself that I want to be. And in, in that way, the saying is uh, work is worship. I mean, I, I completely believe that as well. So uh, just yeah, that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, he said one word that uh, religion, no matter how much we believe in it or not, it's sometimes universal in nature, somewhat universal in nature. So, that made me think of one particular thing that even though all my life I've been a very little or um, 
very little believer of religion i mean i have done all the puja part everything that is a part of a household but um, not as such a believer but every time something wrong used to happen or i was scared of something the reflex response was to um, i mean uh, pray so that is what my uh, my thought uh, when he said the word that universal no matter whether we believe in it or not is universal in nature that was the first thought that came in my mind that every time things go wrong the reflex response or reaction is praying to so close my eyes and think uh, you know please bacha lo wala situation <laughs> i just also want to add something to that so uh, like i said about work is worship so if something uh, comes up in work that is extremely difficult and like i don't know how i'm going to do it there is uh, now i don't no longer have to have that i i no longer pray in work like i just know whether i'll be able to do it or not do it uh but if there is something like uh, <laughs> it's it's really stupid but whenever i sit in a car i don't know how to drive but when, uh, whenever i sit in a car i i have to say a prayer because there are things that can happen which are without in not in my control <laughs> so or like it's this is even sillier but um, uh, and my mom is really religious in the very conventional sense uh, that uh, i started seeing a lot of these insects in the bathroom and it's just like and i i used to get get really scared like okay, what what is happening and it was just suddenly happening and it's, it's been happening here and more, here more. Uh, but she said oh you need to then offer a dua before you enter the toilet so i'm <laughs> just like so uh, but just this feeling of not being in control is uh, and depending on somebody else to save you and in that way not being your ideal self which i i think i am being in say my professional life now but not in say other other things so so just this feeling of control and how much i am able to do it and and which might be uh, seeing uh, my reliance on a higher entity to okay anybody else wants to say anything on this yeah spirituality uh, is not so complicated i think when we think uh, about who am i what is my purpose and what is the world if we think about that i think this is spirituality and religion something is common in all the human being of this earth if something is common in individual level uh this is related to religion i think thank you yeah. and your example is not so silly <laughs> it is uh very important and uh, nice example i think bhaiya mujhe kabhi kabhi matlab aisa lagta hai ki jab bhi main kahin se nikalta hu to mera agar koi temple aa gaya to mera dar bas hi sir jhuk jata hai wo andar se ek dar hota hai ki nahi jhukaya to kuch nuksan ho jayega wo bachpan se kuch aise agreements hain andar to un agreements ki जड़ें इतनी गहरी हैं कि अभी भी ये मतलब बहुत लॉजिकली समझ में आता है कि जब इंसान गुफा में था तो कोई धर्म नहीं था कोई उसकी जात नहीं थी लेकिन फिर भी ये एग्रीमेंट्स इतने गहरे में हैं कि अगर कोई दूसरे धर्म का व्यक्ति अगर कोई मुसलमान ही है या कोई और है चाहे वो कितना अच्छा व्यक्ति है लेकिन उसके साथ वैसे रिलेशन्स मतलब बनाने में बहुत वो होता है तो कहीं ना कहीं भगवान की भी अगर वो हो रही है तो मतलब सर भी झुक रहा है कई बार हम किसी सिचुएशन में एकदम अवॉक होके अपने आप से पूछते हैं आके बंद कर लेते हैं तो वो भी किसी डरवस है वो जान कर नहीं है तो कहीं ना कहीं धर्म को जानने की जरूरत है और कोई रियलिटी है तो वो 
मतलब ऐसा नहीं है कि वो अगर हम इंसान हैं तो उसे जान नहीं सकते पर एक बार मान लेते हैं कि हम इस रिलीजन्स के हैं और सारी मान्यताओं को एक्सेप्ट कर लेते हैं तो हम उस बड़ी रियालिटी को टच करने से चुक जाते हैं they think that he's habituated since childhood to whenever he crosses a temple or something he bends his head and uh, it's more out of fear if he like he did does question why is he doing it but he still does it because he says if he doesn't do it maybe something bad will happen so but he's able to see that that he's having some fear and uh, he says that uh, because we believe in these whatever uh, information of the religions and the the do's and don'ts and everything uh, we don't really get to know it and when we don't get to know it and we straight away start believing in it and start practicing them then uh, we never get to know the the fundamental reality which according to him humans can know i think i'm only echoing what has already been mentioned by a lot of people already in various words is how i see spirituality which i feel is the kernel on which religion is then built is uh, you know we could use the word transcendental or universal or uh, something larger but essentially this capacity or this need or tendency for people to look for something for meaning for purpose and for direction which is which is much beyond the limited time and space i think that that itself is spiritual and then that it, it can grow in its scope to questions that are more and more and more abstract that that all of that is spiritual i believe fast mic based on what different viewpoints have been discussed can we i mean it's a question i don't know if uh, it actually makes sense or not but can we say that uh, religion is very it's a social structure whereas uh, spirituality is individualistic or universal can we i mean is it like something that makes sense i mean since we are not trying to come to a conclusion but uh, if it it makes sense to you that yeah you can say that um i think uh, one function that now i reflect about it the religion has not served in my life but that of my parents life and some of my cousins also is that uh, whenever we we used to grow up and you know festivals and everything we used to gather together in community in the city and so on so it was like the and the idea of religion was very meshed with uh, uh, us as a community so basically it also provided a community and uh, and and cultural identity for sure and uh, i have nothing against the cultural identity to be honest i mean uh, uh, if anything they're very uh, beautiful uh, which came with religion so yeah yeah that that was a point i want to mention uh, i just feel like a uh, cultural identity that the religion is able to imbue us with is also like it 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 has high valence like both politically and socially like uh, even if i don't want to identify even if i don't identify with a particular religion just because my name is something i am i am like you know made to carry the uh, like answer for it which is uh, like which is something that i didn't expect uh, like because i also like very much enjoy the cultural benefits that uh, the religion uh, any religion offers but uh, maybe not anymore <laughs> okay uh, anybody else religion spirituality so we covered lot of topics right and i'm not going on to a new one <laughs> okay so we've covered lot of topics and all these topics will be talking about uh, during the content and this exercise i found it to be very important because it does serve two three purposes objectives the first one is like uh, in any place where you want to explore such things uh, so your thoughts on these which have 
when you come are not really formed. So when you have the opportunity, free opportunity to express if whenever you want to, then they you collect your thoughts and you focus on it and you share something. So that is one benefit. The second is that because you're sharing on that point, we get to know you. That that was the stated objective. So so we got to know each other very well. How everybody thinks, what is being, what is having effect on other by the sharing, right? And the third one is because you sh talked about these things and and we come to a point where nobody has anything more to say, that gives you readiness to listen now. So that was one of my selfish motives. <laughs> because if I started speaking from the first day, there would be a lot of education. No, it doesn't mean this, it means this and that and this. You had your say, now please let me have my say for the next five days. Okay. So. All these things are intermeshed. We'll start with, uh, basically there are three topics we'll cover in this. Okay, mate. So when we talk about Jeevan Vidya, it's going to talk about, one is the study of the human being, one is the study of the human order, uh, how human, or human organization, how humans are organized, and organization in nature. Right? So we'll be studying it from three angles. So, and the first topic that we will talk about is the study of human being. But before that, there is some ground which we need to cover because a lot of input which have come in, uh, how they, I mean, uh, to start a journey, we need to start from one place. So, we'll go to, we'll talk about three fundamental facts that we have. Every human being, after a certain age, starts Acknowledging three fundamental facts. Okay. So, uh, the first one is that I am. So, now I am saying this, this is a fact for all human beings. So, you are a human being. Is it a fact for you that you are? Is it true for you or not? This, so this you have to do, this exercise. When I say this is a fact, then you have to verify whether it is for you a fact or not. Okay. So, I am. Is this a fact for you? you? That you are? You exist? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Is it a fact for you? Okay. Yeah, okay. The second is, because it's not that only I am, there are many other things around me. You guys are there. The building is there. The trees, birds, animals, minerals. And if you look up at the sky in the night, the stars, the moon, sun, so many things. So let's give it a collective name. So whatever is there besides me, I'm also part of this. Let's call it world. So the world is. So is this a fact for you? There are other things besides you, right? And then I am, the world is, and I want to live happily. Is that a fact for you? Do you want to live happily or not? So the thing is that this I is in this world and it's doing something here. And whatever it's doing, it wants to be happy. There's a what is happiness? We'll go into it later. Because that leads us to the three fundamental questions which arise from acknowledging these three facts. The moment we recognize these three fundamental facts, there are three associated, three fundamental questions. Okay. I know 
I am, but I don't know what I am. So that is the first question. So that is one part of the study in Jivan Vidya. So we'll be trying to answer that question for you. It's not we are the first, not the first ones. You you've been studying so many things, so you, this question must have been answered for you in many other ways. Similarly, the world is, but what is this world? Is it an illusion? Is it a place to be happy and be merry? What do we? Is there? What is this world? So this needs to be explored. I know I want to live happily, but what is happiness? That is the third question. Okay. So any study which addresses these three. Here we are calling that knowledge. So study for knowledge and then there is technical studies like learning languages, learning mathematics, how to manage machines, how to grow plants. This is all technical. So when I say knowledge here, I mean these three. These three questions. This is the domain of knowledge. That's the domain of skill sets. So that's the study of skill sets, the technical studies. Okay. So I, world and happy living. These are the three main issues or three main uh, things which we need to focus on when we're talking about knowledge. And it has been talked about since ancient time, since the man has uh, come onto this planet. Even in caves, somebody was mentioning caves, there are paintings which show that they were asking such questions. There was, I mean, there are spiritual and uh, religious paintings found in cave mankind. Right? In fact, probably that was the first reason to go and paint in the caves. So these three questions have been answered in the uh, human tradition early by various people and various uh, philosophies, ideologies. Uh, we are going to put these ideologies, philosophies, religions, everything into two major categories. Okay, so one is the materialist viewpoint, and the other is the spiritual viewpoint. And why are we doing this? So that we know where we are standing today. And in context of this, where we are standing today, I will propose to you what we are going to talk about in Jeevan Vidya. Okay. If you are able to relate to the analysis which I give here, then there is probably a chance that you will feel the need to go into that. Okay. So I am creating the background first for the study. So the present context, where are we standing today? So according to materialism, what am I? A body. Yeah. Very simple. I'm just a body. What is a body? It is born, it lives for some time, then dies. And the story is over. So there is only a Duration of life, which is from birth till death, is a short duration. So when, if you, I am a body, then I have very short time, and I have to do much. How is the world looked at in materialism? It's a physical world. How do we look at it? Yeah. yeah. Youthfulness. Useful. Okay. Yeah. It's a planet also. Yes. So, in this worldview, the world is looked as 
looked at as a resource for the body. So, I am a body, the world is a resource. So, mineral resources, plant resources, animal resources, human resources. Right? We have a human resource ministry also. And in this worldview, what is happy living? Huh? Use the mic, please. We have mics. One by one. Yeah, give it one. Money. Money. Okay. How 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 is money related to happiness? It is right, but how is it related? Achha, sorry, sorry. Ah. <laughs> uh, so that actually uh, material things we can buy. Yeah. So, yeah. So money gives us access to resources. Resources, yes. yes. Consumption. 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 Yes. So happiness is body, I as a body, world as a resource. So I consume the resource. This is happy living. This is a very basic analysis I am giving you of the worldview of materialism. This is how it looks at the world. Any questions or any doubts on this? What, what Which is, is that uh, the question we began, uh, the premise we began with was that uh, the, three, the third question is, uh, the third reality is that I want to live happily. But the question that raises is what is happiness? Which makes me question that if you don't know what happiness is, then why do you want to live happily? You, you, don't, you don't have any recognition of what happiness is. I would change that statement to rather be that I don't want to live unhappily. Because okay. now you have recognition of what unhappiness is. Okay. So here again, I would feel that consumption is a way to not be unhappy. Uh, yeah, to avoid unhappiness. So how how will consumption avoid unhappiness? Because I, the premise would be over here with materialism that if you if you consume, then you won't be unhappy. So. If you think of yourself as a body mm. and the world as a resource mm. and consuming, this is the whole purpose of living is to consume. Mm. And when you're consuming and you look around the examples in your life around you, does this give this consumption, does it give some sense of well-being or not? Yeah, physical well-being. Yeah. So there is no anything beyond physical as I. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that they're saying that consumption is happy living. Because then, or oh, maybe they are. Um, I I had a issue with the previous one more than okay. with this one. The basic essence is to that these are three major areas that we need clar. Uh, answers for and these answers have been given in this form and this is what we are practicing. Have you practiced this? Has anyone, you, anyone of you practiced this? I am just saying, I am a body, the world is a resource and living happily means consumption. So if I am stating this fact that this has come through ages till where we are standing today. So. We might have participated in this. We might have lived like this. So I'm asking, have you lived like this? Okay. Next. Materialism gives us a lot of logic. Why does it give logic? Because materialism basically is based on the fact 
that fundamentally there is only matter. And whatever is happening in matter is resulting in various states. Evolution is in matter and the many mental life order or the plant order or the animal order or the human order is coming out of that matter. These are different states of matter. Right? And the changes, matter is ever changing. And you can observe these changes, you can put a seed in soil, you can see it germinate and then grow and become a full tree and fruit and give the seed back. So you, you can watch this. So you can watch the sequences in nature. Matter is perceived through senses. So material, materialism relies on senses. So anything that can be perceived through senses and instruments which are extension of our senses, like you're wearing specs, is just an extension of your either a telescope or a microscope or a mic or whatever. These are all extension of our senses, right? So anything which can be detected through senses or instruments is reality and anything beyond senses or instruments is non-real. So something to be real has to be detected through senses or instruments. Right? And through senses we can observe things and we can see the sequence of things happening, various stages, various phases which are going through things. So therefore we can see how does a tree come about? It comes from a seed. So we can say this is the, the causality of a tree is a seed. Right? So this activity and causality, this relationship is called logic. Right? So that's how materialism has, is built upon logic. Right? We can take two things, like we can uh, mix two things and we can say this will happen with this. We have done this and anybody can repeat it and verify it, right? Which is the scientific methodology. So, it's built on logic. But it is purposeless. What I mean here by purposeless is, it doesn't give a common purpose to all of us. Here the collective purpose, where here I, what I mean by purpose is the collective purpose. The same purpose for all of us. It is absent. And why is this relevant, having a collective purpose or a common purpose for us? Because we live together, whatever we do has an impact on everyone around us. So, if we were seeking harmony, in case we are seeking harmony, then we will need to work for common goals, common purpose. If we don't work for common purpose, we can't have harmony. I mean, if... Uh if you want harmony collectively, we can also just follow a rule, set of rules collectively. We don't have to strive for some goals, right? Like that's not the only way of getting harm, getting at harmony. Yeah, so following a rule becomes a goal then. That's what, that's what some religions have tried, no? Follow these rules, then we'll be harmonious within ourselves. Following is not so easy. That, that's what we've discovered, right? You said that uh, purposeless, but uh, it's just an example. Uh, when we build a road, yeah. it's for all of us, not for mine or not for the person who made it. So how it's not common? Uh, so when we build a road, there is some reason it is done for some... See, uh, in this uh, system, materialistic system, Everything is done for resources. And who controls the maximum resources has the power. Okay. So a road is built not for the benefit of all. Road is built for profit. And profit comes through movement of goods and services. Right? So it is built for some business. It is not built for well being of all. If there is a road, a lot more other people will also use it. So you can probably charge a small tax to them. And this we have been doing since ancient times. But you want to use my road, you have to pay for it. Right? Yeah. 
माइक माइक even if uh, we talk about something that uh, like a road as she suggested uh, it is going to have a benefit for all or it is useful for everyone the meaning of that road is very different for all of us for example if we have a flyover very nice flyover uh, somebody who owns a good car for that person that flyover is a beneficial thing somebody who has an auto that person is going to uh, have a lot more trouble in uh, taking that thing up something uh, somebody who owns a cart for that person that flyover would be even a bigger trouble and people who had to give up their home so that uh, that flyover could have been built that person would have a very different meaning so that same ro- road which is like useful for everyone has a different meaning of usefulness so like we live in we've lived in noida for some time and at one stage in noida the road infrastructure was improved and uh, once it was improved the crossings for pedestrians the and uh, noida had a lot of cycle rickshaw crossings for them disappeared because in india where only 7.5% population has access to cars all the road infrastructure all the public transport infrastructure is built for car users not even for public transport anyway that's a debate for some other time but there is no common purpose for which we all can work in this you can do anything you can consume anything in any manner doesn't matter as long as you have the power to acquire this so there is a lot of power game in this so the world organized around this is a power centric hierarchy and we all are participating in it presently okay next then on the other hand there also has been in human tradition the idealism or theistic system spiritual systems of knowledge right there also these questions have been answered what is i according to say for example indian spiritual system soul or atma or something like that right some some ex entity which is beyond senses right right and what is the world how do they view the world something to engage with not really something temporary something which distracts you something where you get trapped it's an whether it exists or does not exist that also is questionable so it is an illusion so this what our whatever we are seeing so interestingly in idealism or theism or spiritualism the fundamental reality is not matter it is something beyond matter some ideal substance or object or some people even call it god right so which is perfect which is permanent which is everywhere and everything right something of that sort and since it is beyond senses the fundamental reality or anything real is actually not within the range of senses so they are drawn in some schools of thought they have drawn the conclusion anything which is can be perceived through senses is actually unreal so 
whatever you see or feel or touch is actually unreal in this sight. Here it is anything you touch, feel, see is real. Here it is unreal. So then what is reality? So reality can't be perceived to senses, it has to be realized or it has to be experienced. What is happy, happiness here in this column? So it's, there's a concept of liberation, right, moksha, being liberated. What is liberation basically means? So most of the Indian schools talk about, because we are entrapped in this illusion, this I is entrapped in this illusion, it is engaging with it, it is thinking it is real and trying to seek its happiness. So, becoming liberated from this illusion, breaking away from it. And that's why you do meditation, so that you withdraw from this world and finally withdraw from this body. That's when you become liberated. Okay. So, this is the second set of schools which we are putting on this side, idealism. Essentially, they are saying this. This school of thought has common purpose, which is to become liberated. Everybody, everybody needs to work for that, function for that. And in this, there is a belief of God, so maybe worship the God. That also is common purpose. Or live according to the will of the God. That is the common purpose. But this is totally based, because it's beyond senses, there are only beliefs to go by. There is nothing observable. So therefore it is logicless. So in the end you have to have faith. Faith is the only thing. So any of these schools, there are many, thousands of such schools, which are rooted in idealism. You start with faith, you live with faith, and you end with faith. So it's logic less purpose. It is trying to give you something common for everybody to do, but because there is no logic, therefore there is no unified purpose which comes out finally. So everybody tries to. So what happens here is, so like for example, some of these schools believe in some form of God. So what is this God? So some believe God is formless, some believe God has a form. So there are two schools here. Yeah. And those who believe it is it has got a form, some believe it has got a human form, and some believe it does it doesn't have a human form. So again, there are divide, there is a divide, there are another two schools. Then in human form, is it a male form or a female form? Again, there are two, two schools of thought. If it's a male form, is it the elderly state, life state, or a youthful or a these are all various sects we have. If you look around yourself in India, you will find so many schools of thought. Somebody thinks God is formless, somebody will think they have got form, somebody thinks uh, it's a male, some think it's a female, some say it's a young one, it's, some say it's an elderly one. All various sects are there. And they, are, they have their own schools of thought and they all have their own sets of beliefs and practices and they all believe in liberation of some sort, right? The world is not to be strived for. You just are here for some time, do the minimal and get away from it. That is what the message in all these schools of thought. You are not here permanently because this world is not permanent in itself. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So what are the living program which comes out? If we have this world view or this world view, because the world view you have, you will, this will determine your lifestyle. This will determine what you do in life. Okay.
So, in this, is it time already? So, in this, you you live to accumulate wealth and so accumulation of wealth and comfort. You are a body, the body needs comforts, so that is one of the objects. But since body can't consume these comforts all at one time, therefore you accumulate before somebody else consumes them. So, what we are calling comforts here is whatever you consume with the body, right? Clothes is one comfort, chair is another comfort, right? This room is also one comfort, this project is also another comfort, food that we eat is another comfort. But the body through which we consume these comforts has its limits to consumption. You can only eat that much in one time. You can only wear that much in one time. But because this is the only thing you can do, you want to consume more and more and there is a limit of the body which is not allowing you to consume the maximum at any given moment. Therefore, you keep hoarding, I will consume it later. So, this is where the accumulation or the hoarding tendency which comes. Interestingly, present form of living on this planet is dominated by this. We are doing this. Okay. And I am doing this, you are doing this, you are doing this, everybody is doing this. What are they doing? They want to consume as much as possible. How much time we have? Very short between birth and death. So, limited time and we want to consume as much as possible. Right? And the body is not allowing us to consume maximum, it is only allowing us to consume limited. So, we want to have our own control over so that if I possible I will consume more, but I should have access to it. So, I try to have access over more and more resources. So, I am and the same thing I am doing, you are doing everybody, everybody is wanting more and more resources. So, what does this lead to? This leads to struggle amongst us. Because I want this, because we are living in this campus and I want to consume the maximum and I want to have control over the maximum resources and so do you do, so do you. So, what happens? We have a conflict and we have a struggle and whenever there are struggle and conflict, what is the law which functions there? Natural law or human law? Huh? Or might is right? So, the only law which is functioning in the human domain in this world view is might is right. Though we have courts of law and everything and so many systems, but in the end whoever is more powerful wins. What does it lead to? So, this leads to lopsided development, so there are movements against this, so protests, and movements which end up in pretty So, it ends up in struggle and war. And war is also decided by might is right, nothing else. So, all our mechanisms that we have developed and we are using right now, whether it is the family, whether it is the communities, whether it is the society, whether it is our production systems, whether they are exchange systems, transportation systems, everywhere we are 
some way or the other ending up here. For short time they seem to work, but eventually they slip into this. Interestingly, we don't want this. We don't like this. That is the irony of the whole thing. We don't like this. We don't accept war in a normal state of mind. Hmm? <laughs> market kitchen. I don't know. Market, if market were falling and that, that is why we didn't want war, then wars would have ended much earlier. Actually, markets can be manipulated through wars. So, for the larger society, this is where we are stuck. So, when we go to school to study history, we study the following war was, this war was fought at this time and this war was fought at that time and the whole history is full of that. Fighting over resources between communities. Okay? So, maybe I will stop at this because our time is over. And uh, tomorrow morning, we'll continue from here. Think about this if you have any questions, any clarifications are needed. Right? Okay. Thank you.